So we're very happy to have Megan Jana Santi today from Princeton. She will tell us about how to destroy a galaxy with dark matter. So brace yourself. <laughs> uh, thanks so much for the invitation to come. Always super fun uh, coming up to NYU. Um, I'm happy to make this talk as informal or formal as you'd like, so please feel free to interrupt with any questions at any point. Um, so my, my group has been working now for the last few years. We've been thinking a lot about how different dark matter models end up affecting how galaxies form and evolve. Um, with the long-term goal being to try to understand what types of observables we can rely on with some of the upcoming data from uh, Hugo Analysis T, uh, Euclid, and other observatories as a way of kind of directly testing fundamental particle physics um, in the sky. Uh, and so in this sort of process, what, one of the things that we've needed to do is try to figure out how to simulate different dark matter models because making predictions for what a particle physics Lagrangian does on a galactic scale um, requires integrating gravity into the picture, and so we need to rely on simulations. Um, so I will we'll definitely be sort of touching on a variety of topics kind of related to that in terms of how we've been integrating these models into simulations and what we've been learning from that. And in that process, how we've discovered that you can destroy a galaxy with some of your different dark matter models that you, you can uh, uh, attempt to, to work with. Um, so the, you know, the sort of the broad scale motivation for this is really just trying to test the hypothesis of cold dark matter, uh, which has been, you know, obviously spectacularly confirmed on cosmological scales, but now we want to sort of push down as with any hypothesis, you want to make sure that it holds on every scale. Um, so we want to push down to galaxy scales, subgalactic scales to see whether or not the model still holds up. If, um, if it does, great, then, you know, I think that sort of is a robust um, proof uh, that CDM, cold dark matter, uh, is, is a viable model for dark matter. And if it doesn't, then we need to ask ourselves, how do we end up changing our dark matter model to fit the data? Um, and the reason why I've been very excited about this is mainly because so much of the data that's going to be coming online in the next few years and decades is really on these galactic scales. So there's going to be a vast opportunity for, for doing particle physics there and um, there's a lot of space there for the theory to kind of try to catch up so that we can make these predictions and interpretations of the data robust. Um, so that's, well, I guess that's what I sort of meant to indicate here with this slide where what we want to do is sort of really kind of combine the sort of new picture we, that's really been forming on the particle theory side, um, really demonstrating that you can have really a, a wide breadth of different dark matter models. So we've moved beyond just um, this picture where the dark matter is weakly interacting massive particle and recognizing that there's a variety of ways in which you can produce dark matter in the early universe to give you the correct abundance. Um, and that opens up kind of a, a, a really broad range of masses that are, that are feasible and interactions and so forth. Um, and all of this is sort of coming at a time where numerical simulations have um, developed to a point where we can produce uh, galaxies, um, simulate galaxies, and uh, sort of get the, the generic features of those galaxies um, to be roughly correct. They're not precise, um, but uh, you know, comparing to maybe 15, 20 years ago, where you couldn't produce a stable stellar disk in one of these galaxies, it's really kind of very impressive the amount of progress that's been made on that side. And then, as I mentioned, just the amount of data that we're going to be coming, getting in hand. So for the first part of the talk, I'm going to just focus on cold dark matter and just kind of delve into how um, cold dark matter ends up affecting galaxies um, and also a lot of the uncertainties that come into play when we just are modeling cold dark matter alone. And then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to start generalizing what happens when we start adding um, additional uh, interactions to our dark matter physics and start talking about what that ends up doing to, to the galaxies. So this uh, image is just kind of summarizing how a galaxy is born in the very early universe and ultimately develops into, um, I think for this cartoon, it's really to like a Milky Way mass system. Um, so we start in the beginning with you know, dark matter over density, um, and that ends up becoming a region that seeds a, a larger dark matter halo that captures uh, gas. And that gas starts becoming the um, sort of the nuclear region that you start forming stars. Um, and then through the mergers of these sort of smaller proto-galaxies, you build in 
build up larger and larger systems until you end up reaching, you know, a, a galaxy that's the size of the Milky Way with this sort of well-defined uh, stellar disk that's rotating with very specific characteristic properties to that. And when you go in and you change the properties of the dark matter, you can affect this evolution at a variety of different stages in the picture. So starting from perhaps just changing the distribution of where you see these, um, these initial dark matter overdensities to, for example, what happens when two galaxies are actually colliding with each other and what happens to the dark matter halos in that process and so forth. Um, and so one of our like one of the primary goals here is to try to build up enough intuition that we can sort of understand if we're staring at a particle physics Lagrangian and then thinking about this process, how changes to that particle physics Lagrangian would end up end up impacting the story at various stages. Um, so in the in the cold dark matter picture, um, there's a lot of structure when we're looking at a galaxy a lot of dark matter structure we're looking on the scale of a galaxy and smaller so the visible part of the galaxy is obviously going to be surrounded by this halo of dark matter um, but even within that halo there's going to be small regions that are, are small over densities of dark matter so those would be smaller sub halos that are still orbiting around that larger system so this is what the milky way would look like if you put on your dark matter goggles and I mean, you see kind of the wealth of that structure the Largest of these subhalos are will themselves have gas and stars in them, so those would be the dwarf galaxies that we actually do observe in um, the Milky Way. And the amount that we've been learning, let me get this video going. Um, yeah, so we've been just learning a tremendous amount about this structure in in our own galaxy. Um, in recent years, mostly the data, a lot of data has been coming from Gaia, also Dark Energy Survey. Um, this movie is just showing um, dwarf galaxies. The dwarf galaxies are shown by boxes. Um, so like these ones here. Um, and then these sort of stringy things, there are stellar streams that have been discovered. So a stellar stream is a, a very coherent stream of stars that forms either when a globular cluster or a dwarf galaxy is disrupted as it's falling into the Milky Way. Um, so discoveries of stellar streams are usually, they're very powerful. Um, because they can tell you something about um, the interactions that occurred as the Milky Way grew. So with uh, the advent with Gaia data and DES, we've been able to map out many more of these streams, um, also detect fainter dwarf galaxies. And all of this is just going to get better in the years ahead. And specifically, Ruben LSST is going to be able to map this out to much further distances away from the sun than we've gotten with Gaia. So, um, so this, that movie I just showed you was already Kind of uh, was was illustrating the amount of structure we've seen kind of locally near the sun, and Rubin's going to allow us to take that and extrapolate it to the outskirts of the Milky Way galaxy. Um, so it's going to be extraordinarily powerful in that context. Um, in addition to kind of the the general structure that we see inside of the halo, we can also sort of dig deep in and um, and uh, and sort of ask sort of what are the properties of this that end up telling us something about the particle physics nature of dark matter. So one thing is just sort of general population properties of these dwarf galaxies and dark subhalos. So um, the simplest way of characterizing that is literally just to count the number of these subhalos that you see at any given mass or expect at any given mass. Um, so that's shown here. This is just count as a function of mass. Um, and these red stars are the classical dwarf galaxies in the Milky Way. So we're seeing those down to masses of roughly um, a little over 10 to the 9. And then as you go down to, to smaller and smaller masses, what ends up happening is that your subhalo is not massive enough to itself be able to capture gas and stars. And so they, the subhalo remains dark. Um, so going and extrapolating down here, any structure that you're getting down there, those would be um, dark subhalos that are kind of just flying around in the Milky Way. And a very crisp prediction for cold dark matter is that as you go down to those lower masses, you're predicting more and more and more of those dark substructures. Um, versus if you change the model, so these other colored lines are, um, there's an atomic self-interacting dark matter, fuzzy, warm dark matter. Um, you can end up wiping out some of that structure or enhancing it. So being able to build up this picture here helps us to sort of test different models. And these points 
here are just showing where current constraints are that are um, trying to detect these dark substructures, um, mainly through their gravitational impact on, uh, on other things. So for example, the streams bounds, which are shown in blue, um, are coming from taking, looking at these stellar streams, which I showed you on the previous slide, um, and looking for breaks in the streams where a dark subhalo might have flown through and perturbed the stream. So that's one way in which you'd actually be able to see the gravitational impact of those dark substructures. And so the bounds right now are, you know, we have some degree of sensitivity down to oh, just, yep. Nice. So these theoretical curves, how robust they are to modeling of baryonic physics? Ah, uh, yeah, oh, I'm, I'm going to get to that. Um, okay. uh, it, it'll depend on the model and and things like that, but to some sense, we, that's what we need to we need to try to understand that. So there there may very well be like large bands around this, but like that's that's kind of the open question right now that we need to to really get at so that we know like whatever measurement we get, we can actually make a statement about the model itself. So, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Right. Oh, there's another question. Yeah. Does the line keep going? Yeah, so the CDM line, which is in black, does keep going up, and it'll go up down to like Earth scale masses. So there's a whole other set of challenges when you're looking for substructures that are that small. Um, with the techniques that are listed here, like with strong lensing and with streams, the hope is that we'd ultimately be able to get down to like 10 to the 6. That's probably the most optimistic that we can do with these these particular techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you mentioned the fuzzy dark matter, so do me you don't include the self interaction and the and the, for the large theta not axion is the one with the large self interaction. Yeah, I, I think this fuzzy dark matter model is sort of like very vanilla fuzzy dark matter. Yes. Yeah. What's the uh, reference on the bottom? I can't read it. Uh, Danik at all? Danik? Danik. Danik. Danik, yeah. This year? Uh, no, uh, 2019. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in addition to just counting the number of these systems that we see, the number of these subhalos, the internal properties of the subhalos are also really important for learning something about the dark matter properties. So in cold dark matter, um, what we find is in simulations that, that only have dark matter and don't have any baryons, sort of universally, regardless of scale, we always end up recovering a profile for the dark matter density for a subhalo that looks like this. Um, it's a double falling power law that goes as one over R in the inner region and one over R cubed in the outer region, um, referred to as the Namero Frank White profile. Um, and so we call this Cusby because you end up with um, sort of a concentration of dark matter near the center. And so in this very simple picture, like regardless of whether or not you're talking about a Milky Way, a dwarf galaxy, or one of these dark subhalos, you'd expect this NFW profile to apply. The story gets complicated, though, when you add in baryons um, to this picture, which obviously are going to be important. Um, and the reason is that when you have baryons, you form stars, Stars live their life cycle at the end, they're going to explode. Uh, so you have supernova explosions that are going to inject energy in the system. Um, and when you inject energy via the supernova, you end up redistributing the matter that's there. Um, and so this modeling of this stellar feedback remains a really significant source of uncertainty in simulations. And to illustrate that in sort of a very simple way, um, I'm showing here a simulation of a stellar disk. Um, I don't remember in what size galaxy, but I think it might have been like a Milky Way size system. And each panel here is just varying a particular aspect of the supernova um, explosion rate, in particular, it's the delay time. Um, and so you can see that the, the structure of that stellar disk changes a lot depending on this parameter. Um, for example, when this delay time is really large, that ends up meaning that you tend to form very clustered regions of star formation that all end up kind of blasting at the same time. And so that ends up giving you these kind of large voids in that disk because coming from um, these sort of very significant explosion events versus in this scenario here where the explosion events are kind of happening more continuously um, and are sort of smaller, have a sort of smaller magnitude effect. Um, so this is just kind of illustrating um, in a very sort of pictorial way 
that uh, the significant impact that this has just on the stellar part, the baryonic part of the, the distribution. Um, it does also have an effect on the dark matter in these systems. And so in particular, what it does is it, this feedback will typically, what we say, call it core, the center of the halo, because it's going to, um, it will tend to excite the dark matter onto larger radial orbits. So it'll tend to push the dark matter out from the center part of the, of the halo. Um, yeah. I'm a little bit confused. Uh, if the only interaction of dark matter is gravitational interaction, how come that the supernova pushes it out? Oh, great question. Um, the supernova is going, the supernova explosion ends up mainly affecting the district, direct, it directly affects the distribution of the baryons. But as you move the baryons out, then the dark matter is going to end up feeling that effect, and then it also ends up um, sort of responding. So it's a back reaction to the change that's happening to the to the baryons. Even if the explosion is pretty much spherical in nature. Um, yeah. So the the each individual explosion may be approximately spherical, but the, what's causing sort of the large scale effect is. You have a whole bunch of these supernovae that are all going off in, in this and kind of concentrated in the central region of the galaxy. And then the degree or size of the effect ends up depending very sensitively on the um, size of each of those explosions and also how you distribute the supernova in, in your disk. Um, <clears throat> so the once you start including these effects. Um, like I said, you end up affecting the, the dark matter distribution here. And um, one way to summarize this is in a plot where we just look at the inner slope of this profile as a function of galaxy mass. So where galaxy mass here is a Milky Way mass system, and here is a, a ultra faint dwarf, so a really, really sort of small dwarf. Um, <clears throat> in the case where we don't have any baryons and we just have vanilla cold dark matter, um, that's the scenario where we always get this NFW profile. So the inner slope is always going to be roughly around negative one. Once we add baryons and you get this coring effect that, that occurs, um, your inner slope will vary depending on the mass of the system. Um, and actually that yellow band, um, this is a cartoon image that's based off of numerical simulations, that yellow band actually is pretty easy to understand intuitively. Um, for the ultra faint dwarfs, when you're on this end, you just don't have very many stars in your dwarf galaxies. So you don't form very many supernova. So the degree of feedback is pretty small here. It's almost as if you didn't have any stars in the first place. So this just looks like a cold dark matter, very simple NFW profile. Then as you move to larger dwarfs, you increase the number of supernova in your system because you galaxy is getting bigger, you have more baryons, you're forming more stars, you get more supernova. And as you form more supernova, this feedback effect becomes more and more important. And as you move along this way, you tend to form more cores inside of your dwarf galaxies. So that's why you see this rising here. Then it turns around and comes back down because as you continue growing to these larger mass galaxies going to Milky Way mass, um, obviously a Milky Way mass system is going to have more stars than a dwarf galaxy, but it also just has a much deeper gravitational potential well because it's a really big galaxy. And so out in this region here, you're still having supernova feedback, but it just isn't as efficient at coring the galaxy because you just have a much deeper gravitational potential well. So that kind of explains this distribution. And so what this is telling you is that just within the regular cold dark matter picture, um, you're going to expect a range of uh, properties for the inner regions of your galaxies, depending on the mass of that galaxy. Um, so you, with most efficient coring happening around these kind of bright and classical. And, and this was assuming a, a picture of continuous uh, accretion of, of, of dwarfs, so that yes, in principle. Uh, yeah, so the, the like I said, this is a cartoon from simulations, yeah, yeah. from simulation data, but the and so the spread here is coming from sort of scatter that you see in different simulations. I was thinking about the Milky Way because the assemble it was assembled from smaller stuff. Yeah. Anyway, it's not so obvious. Yeah, yeah. so problem. all of these simulations are cosmological, so they are, they're going to include all of the mergers. Yeah. 
Yeah, but also the very so it's some sort of oh yeah zoom in on, on a cosmological yeah it's a simulation. cosmological they're all cosmological hydrodynamic simulations yeah um, and just to kind of give you a perspective most of the data that we have now on dwarf galaxies is kind of concentrated in this region here and I'm going to come back to this later but it's been one of the reasons why it's been really hard to, to really kind of make definitive statements about dark matter properties based off of dwarf galaxies so far. Um, because most of the data is concentrated in this regime where you expect that these baryonic effects are going to be really important. And so once the data sort of improves and we can start probing away from that, um, we'll hopefully be able to, to make statements that are a bit more definitive. Yes? So is, is, is how, how robust is like the region where you're near n equals zero, is it within the simulations, could you like vary other parameters such that you could expand that so you could have a larger region? But I mean, say as if you're, you came and you, you show up in you know, five years and you say classical dwarfs have n equals zero, uh, and this you know, is flat, are you then going to say, that tells me, or, I mean, I know you're maybe gonna get to this, but is it possible to just say, well, I'm gonna tweak my parameters, my simulations, and have a broader region where four of these things? Uh, yeah, so I mean, I think it's going to be, I think that I'm going to address this in the next slide, okay. because Wait. it's not just the end, because the next thing I was going to say, the other thing that's important is actually the spread in that yellow band. Um, if I don't understand oh, it, right, oh, then, then, then tell me to come back to it. Um, so the, where most of this data is coming from is literally just rotation curves of galaxies. So this is kind of like, I don't know, it's kind of nice because it's sort of kind of going back to the basics for for dark matter, right? So, and the the data, uh, the largest catalog of rotation galaxy rotation curves we have comes from Spark. Um, this is just showing some of the Spark data for a set of um, dwarf galaxies that kind of all are roughly the same mass. And this is their circular velocity as a function of radius. And one of the things that's pretty striking is the amount of variation that you see in these dwarf uh, in these rotation curves. So they all roughly end up asymptoting to the same value, which is what you'd expect since they all kind of have the same mass, but they do it at very different rates. So that suggests that the ones that are kind of in red are going to be uh, galaxies that are going to be more cored, and then the ones that are in blue are galaxies that are more cuspy. So this is telling us that even when we look at galaxies of roughly the same mass, we're seeing a pretty big spread in their inner, inner profiles. Um, and matching that specifically is really hard. Um, so it's not just a matter of are we accurately predicting cores versus cusps, it's are we accurate, accurately predicting cores versus cusps the right number of times, and we're not. Um, this slide is super technical, but demonstrates this point. Um, so this panel here is um, the y-axis is a you can just think, because this is kind of complicated, you think of the y-axis just a measure of how cored or cuspy the inner region of the dark matter halo is, with cored being down here and cuspy being up here. And then the x-axis is just telling you the baryon fraction in that galaxy. Each dot here is a, is a separate galaxy um, that we measure in the SPAR catalog, so where we have a rotation curve for it. Um, so the different, each one here, so you see you have a spread, Within Spark, we're getting some systems that are more cored, others that are more cuspy for a range of baryonic fraction inside those galaxies. Um, there's a little bit of a correlation here where um, the more baryons you have, you see that the system is a little bit more cored. And when you say the baryon fraction, you don't mean integrated, you mean in the central region, or what do you mean by the baryon fraction? Um, it's, okay, so it's, slightly complicated. So they have this, um, this they, they're taking the contribution of the baryons to the rotation curve at a particular, um, at a particular radius. And so it is kind of in this, it, it is in the inner region. So you can think of it as roughly in the inner region. Yeah. Um, so this is coming from the data. And the idea would be that we want to be able to reproduce that with simulations because that would tell us we're getting close in terms of um, implementing our feedback in baryonic physics. Um, but we're really not. So if you, each panel here is essentially a reproduction of this. 
So the data now is just shown in gray and the crosses show samples of dwarf galaxies that have been simulated and where they kind of fall in this plane. Um, so for example, this one here, the crosses correspond to galaxies that have been simulated in this Mihao framework. These are the Eagle simulations here, and um, I think those are the Apostle up there. And I think the one thing that just is very striking is that none of these simulation frameworks are actually able to capture the specific range of chord versus cusp. So sometimes they give you chord, sometimes they give you cusp, but exactly how they do it and how it depends on baryonic fraction in each of these isn't fully captured. <clears throat> So there's a lot of ongoing work in terms of improving, continuously improving these um, the simulations. Um, but there's additional tools that, that are being developed to kind of help in this process of really trying to, um, to get at these feedback prescriptions. Um, one tool that's um, particularly useful is using semi-analytic modeling. Um, so there's these, uh, in the semi-analytic modeling, you essentially take, let's say, a Milky Way and you initialize some dwarf galaxy. And then you just evolve the evolution of that dwarf galaxy, um, essentially just doing orbit integration. Um, but you can fold into it additional complexity so you can have the system, you can have your generator essentially emulate some of the physics from these more involved simulations, simulation codes. And the benefit of this is it allows you to sort of very efficiently change some of the um, uh, properties of the baryonic physics um, and rapidly kind of iterate on that, which is really hard to do when you're running a full simulation that can take months to finish. Um, so in, this is just showing some work from, led by my student Dylan Folsom. He was using one of these sort of semi-analytic modelers um, and trying to generate properties for different dwarf galaxies. So um, in particular, this is just showing the results for Fornax. So he essentially could generate um, thousands of Fornax galaxies with the semi-analytic code and look at its central density and orbital properties. Um, and then he could vary the kind of feedback prescriptions that are used very easily. Um, and so, for example, here he's showing that when using one particular feedback model, he can get Fornax galaxies with falling in this range here, shown by the blue. And then if he switches the feedback modeling and turns it to a different one, he ends up only generating Fornax galaxies that live in this purple region. Um, we have data on both of these quantities that are shown by the solid hatch regions there. And so you can just see here, because we have statistical samples that are large enough that um, the data, which is getting really good, a lot of this data is coming from Gaia, um, points us to the fact that one of these feedback models is actually giving us something that's aligning with the data, and another one is very much not. Um, and so this is sort of a first demonstration that we can use these semi-analytic tools to start excluding and ruling in different feedback models very efficiently. Um, and building on this, like, so, I mean, ideally what one would do is actually sort of have in the future, you could sort of actually fit a bunch of free parameters for these feedback models to the data and actually kind of build up your models in that, in that way. So that's kind of like the long-term direction for that. Okay, uh, having spent some time kind of discussing the intricacies of just understanding the modeling for cool dark matter, I'm going to jump now and switch a little gears a little bit to talk about the impact of now when we start changing the dark matter physics as well. Um, so I'm going to be sort of talking in this context of dark sectors where you can have, you put all your dark matter physics um, in a separate sector. So you can have more than one dark matter particle, you can have new forces in that sector. And that sector may or may not communicate directly with the standard model, um, depends on whether or not you have any uh, mediators here. Uh, for everything I'm going to be describing, um, we don't need any mediators. We're only going to be testing the particle physics, like content of this sector through its gravitational impact on the galaxies themselves. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about what happens when you start introducing self interactions into your dark matter, um, which is obviously different than the cold dark matter picture where the dark matter is collisionless. Um, and initially, I'm going to start with just a case where the self interactions are elastic. Um, that's probably the model that's been considered the most extensively. Um, and I'll kind of describe the uh, sort of the status of where that discussion is. And then 
Um, we'll generalize that to a scenario where the self interactions are actually inelastic and so your dark matter can cool because it can lose energy. So for the elastic self inter interaction case, um, this is the model that we're going to consider. So one where the self scattering is described by the Yukawa potential in the non relativistic limit. Um, and just kind of going through this quickly in these kinds of scenarios, you end up with a, a scattering a self scattering cross section that depends on particle velocity. Um, so in this illustration here we have self interaction cross section as a function of B. Um, each one of these curves is essentially just um, the cross section here, but just for different values of the free parameters sigma naught and omega. So as I vary the sigma naught and the omega, on which velocity scale the self interactions are going to be most pronounced. Um, so for example, in the scenario where I might have the blue curve, the self interactions would be relevant for dwarf scale velocities, but would not be present in clusters versus in the green curve, um, you'd expect self interactions to be occurring in the dark matter halos of both the dwarfs and the clusters. To get an idea, what is the mass ratio that you consider here on this plot? This, because it's omega there, but what is the three, the four colored lines? Uh, yeah. Yes. Right. So, oh, for you mean yeah. specific for these four colored lines? Yeah, but roughly speaking, yeah, what is it? Um, I don't remember exactly what uh, what I used to make these lines, but typically we're talking about like, well, it's sort of a very classic example that would map onto this would be like a GV scale um, dark matter mass and like an, an MEV scale mediator or something like that. Um, so when you add these self interactions, the resulting impact on what happens to Sorry, the dark I, I can't. <laughs> but what range of values did you consider? Was that bigger range coming from like a factor of three or a factor oh, of a thousand? For this? Well, so you can sort of see Between it here, right? Because it, the omega is telling you roughly where that turnover is yes. going to be in this velocity curve, right? So the so, estimate of 100. Yeah, so it's right. roughly over 100 here. I mean, I guess the turnover here is maybe like, yeah, 100 more. Okay, so this turnover is determined by this. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, it's being square. set by where omega, omega square matters. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It would be easier to read off if it were in B over C, but. So then you can read it off. Yes. I understand it's the physical unit, but if you just put that in B over C, then, then you know the mass. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, my previous comment was just to say that a lot of these kinds of models are we're really kind of talking about like sub GV dark matter. So just in terms of if you're kind of grounding it in terms of WIMPs, we're usually talking about much lighter dark matter. But you said it's only the ratio of the mediator it and is, the dark yeah. matter. So, so the mass it. of the dark matter yes. apparently doesn't matter. Uh, according to your yes, saying, I mean, but in terms of like also just the early universe cosmology and things like that, usually the kinds of scenarios people are talking about, it's like sub GV, but yeah, you're right. The, the specifically here, right, that's it's the ratio that's setting the particular uh, distribution for that cross section of the velocity cutoff. But also, this ratio is large enough such that there is no dissipation due to emission of this. Right? So that's the ratio. Uh, yes, that, yeah, yeah. That, mm -hmm. um, so the, the aspect, I, mean, I think the self-interacting picture is so beautiful because of how it ends up affecting just how halos, dark matter halos form. Just a very simple, it's a very different picture from cold dark matter. We sort of just think like, okay, you know, I, I form this NFW halo and then that's, that's that, right? But when we start allowing the dark matter to interact with itself, it gives us a means of transferring heat from one region of the halo to the other. Um, so, and this actually ends up occurring in two different stages. So the first stage is one where the self interactions transfer heat to the inner part of the halo. And as it does that, it heats up the inner region um, and you end up forming uh, a core in the inner region. And this is kind of the standard picture that people usually think of when we talk about self interactions. It's usually oh, self interactions end up giving me large cores in my dark matter halo. Um, and that is true, except only in this sort of first stage. That's where you form this, this core. Um, so if we come back to this, um, this diagram that we were looking at earlier, uh, which earlier, if you remember, this is the inner slope of the density profile and the ga galaxy mass. This is the expectation for cold dark matter when you don't have any baryons. Yellow is when you add baryons in. And if you have self-interactions that are in this early core formation process, 
Um, the expectation is that the SIDM uh, looks something like this. Your, your inner your inner slope looks something like this. So you would form cores going down to these really small uh, small dwarf galaxies. And then up here, you end up just looking like cold dark matter because, um, again, the gravitational potential for your system is so deep that uh, even just the self interactions aren't enough to, to prevent, like, to form the core. The, they're always just going, you're always going to go back to a cusp, essentially. Um, and again, just reminding you where most of the data is up here, which is one of the reasons why a lot of these tests for self interactions have been so kind of muddied in terms of interpretation, because we're always living in this, right now, we're living in this regime where the cold dark matter predictions and the self interaction predictions are both giving us some degree of coring. And so um, it makes it very hard to distinguish the two models with the current set of data. And you can see this very visually. Um, these were some fits of rotation curve data that um, two undergrads at Princeton worked on. Uh, this is actually the first summer of the pandemic, so this was their project, fitting, fitting models to rotation curve data. This is rotation curves from Spark. Um, the, there's, these are three different galaxies, and uh, we fit different models to them. So uh, cold dark matter models, self-interacting dark matter models, those are the different colors. And you can see by eye in each of these, um, we can't really tell the difference. They're all, they're all fitting the data like roughly equally well. Um, we did this for like 90 galaxies, not just these three. And we did like a whole Bayesian analysis on this to see if the data preferred one of these models over the other. And right now it just couldn't tell the difference. It just had no preference for a self-interacting model versus a cold dark matter model. I'm confused because there was so much variation as you showed us from galaxy to galaxy. So were you, what were you tuning to get these fits? Um, so for the cold dark matter model, the yellow one is uh, literally just using an NFW profile, so that's very, very simple. The um, red one is a more complicated model that allows you to um, vary a few parameters that actually um, determine the, it allows you to get core formation that is set by the mass of your galaxy. Um, so I guess what I, I didn't ask a question well. So were these like examples in cosmological models where different amounts of stuff fall in? So everyone would wind up different, and then you look to see if you can find one that fits the galaxy. Is that the strategy? No, no, no. So we had analytic models for the density distribution of dark. Oh, so it's sort of an isolated halo. It was an isolated okay. halo. Yeah, but the the red one here would be um, would include. Uh, would include feedback in the cold dark matter prediction. But basically, there, there's almost no variance, I guess. I guess I'm confused by that. How do you, do you just give up accounting for variance and? Well, we actually, find what, what we did is we try to recover the variance. So we do the fits and just, then we and see then, what we get back. With three parameters, so to speak. With three parameters, and then we look to see what the degree of variance is that we're getting. That you had to put the, in to allow for Yeah, it. that's right. Um, Oh, yeah. And these self interactions that don't affect other things like CMB is not affected? It's effects of the self interactions early on? Um, so, for this kind of very vanilla self interact, I don't want to say like in general, because you can always kind of embed these in like other models where maybe you could. But for these kinds of vanilla SIDM models, the, the expectation is that it shouldn't. So, the idea is that you're only really going to start, the self interactions are only going to be important when the density dark matter density is high enough that you're start, going to start getting scattering. So it should only be relevant in the inner parts of your halo. Um, it, it is an open question as to whether or not this would actually end up changing like the merger. Yeah, like just structure the, formation. The merge, very, yeah, very exactly. The usual assumption is that it doesn't, but that mm -hmm. hasn't actually been tested directly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But also the universe is really young. There's not a lot of time for a scattering to happen. If these things flatten out at low velocities, right? Yeah, it's more the question of whether or not, like, the distribution of the subhalos today would be the same as you would expect from CDM. Oh yeah, no, I, yeah, I like, meant, for, meant from the CMB though. Oh, yeah, oh, no, no, the CMB. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, yeah, I was thinking the, the about in terms of the smallest subhalos as they form or they Yeah, that's right. But in terms of CMB, is there a variable? Yeah, you wouldn't, wouldn't expect yeah. that. Yeah. Um, is there a way to understand why? 
there is no punctuation between the no feedback versus the feedback point. Um, I'm just trying to map it back to the blog where you have that feed. Um, yeah. Um, so that's actually the one that does have the most variation, but it's a little hard to see. So you can you can see it here where the CDM no feedback is the yellow. And it does a much it does do actually in this case a worse job than the one with feedback in this at the low radius region. And that is the one case where we were able to statistically say that um, the one with feedback is preferred over the one without feedback when we look over all 90 galaxies. So we, we are seeing that that is actually a better fit because it has more flexibility in capturing the voice. Yeah, thanks. I kind of um, glossed over that, but it's an important point. Um, okay, cool. So the SIDM story doesn't end there, though. And this is the part that I find really interesting. Uh, which is you don't just stop at core formation at a certain point. So that's kind of an unstable um, state in the system. Um, then in the second stage, the direction of heat transfer changes. Um, so the heat flow now moves outwards. And as that happens, um, your core ends up shrinking in size and heating up. Um, and as it shrinks and heats up, it only sort of further accelerates the heat flow outwards. And so you end up in this sort of catastrophic regime where your core is just rapidly collapsing in this sort of exponential, um, in this exponential way. And so like the end state of this would probably be some formation of like a black hole or something like that. Um, this core collapse process has actually been well studied in the context of globular clusters. So it's actually just sort of a very standard like astrophysics phenomenon, um, but was only sort of more recently recognized to sort of be relevant for um, SIDM halos. Uh, it sort of rather dramatically changes the story, though, because you're now not looking for just, you know, these pores. You can end up with systems that can be in this core collapse phase, um, and that ends up um, affecting the kinds of observables you would look for. Um, so just to kind of give you a sense for um, what regions of parameter space are remaining, this was work that was led by Orrin Sloan a few years ago. Um, this is, again, this is our model, our SIDM model. Right? So we have two free parameters, the sigma naught and the omega. And those are the two axes here. So our cross section is here and our velocity scale is there. Um, and the shaded out regions are excluded. Um, so the, this region up here is excluded by data coming from galaxy clusters and galaxy groups. Um, and then this blue band here is excluded by data coming from the Draco uh, Draco door. Um, so the white regions are what remains um, that are viable for this self interacting dark matter model. This slice here is essentially in the regime where you're starting to just look like cold dark matter. Um, this slice here is the part that's really interesting because that's a region where gravothermal collapse has to be happening to some degree. So what this is telling you is that in terms of the remaining regions of parameter space, if you have this velocity dependent self interactions, gravothermal collapse has to be occurring to some degree. Um, and this has sort of forced us to deal with two things. We need to go back and we need to revise how we're doing simulations to make sure we can capture this process. And then the second is we need to revise and rethink our strategy for the kinds of observables we're going to look for, because the predictions are going to be different when um, if you live out here in this regime where gravothermal collapse is relevant. The first thing, the going back and revising simulations, it's actually been really hard. Um, there already aren't very many simulations for self-interacting dark matter in the core expansion phase. Um, and you might say, okay, well, that's fine. The codes are still written. You can just go in, turn the knob, go into, you know, pick a set of parameters that will give you core collapse, and then everything is going to be great. Uh, it's unfortunately not. Uh, and one of the things that we've been realizing and coming to grips with is the fact that uh, simulations of self interactions are really sensitive to the numerical implementation of those self interactions. And you become even more sensitive to all of that when you're trying to zero in on this core collapse phase because you're essentially needing to properly model everything as your dark matter particles in your simulation are getting crammed into these very small regions of space where um, like the way you implement gravitational scattering also ends up having an effect. 
Um, so this is very technical. Um, and the plot I'm showing here that I threw up here is also very technical. Um, but I just wanted to show on this. So this is showing like evolution of core density as a function of time. Um, you expect the sort of rough expectation for self-interaction is you start off by decreasing. This is where you form your large core and then you collapse there. Um, this each curve here is essentially a different numerical implementation of this. And you can see that there's a really big spread. Um, and that spreads coming from changing how the self interactions are implemented in the code, the numerical resolution, a lot of details like that. And so we're just at a point of really kind of understanding what the problems are, but not even really understanding how to fix the problems. So just to say that this is sort of this is one of the challenges when we're trying to kind of implement this in the code, there's a lot of subtlety that's there and you need to make sure to get it right because otherwise you're going to run things and you might end up interpreting the result as being a physical effect when it shouldn't be one. Um, and then the other thing that we need to go back and rethink is sort of this, the actual observational like astrophysical observables that we would use to look for these dark matter models, SIDM models in the gravitational regime. Um, and so Warren is now um, he's finishing a paper that sort of explores how we can use populations of dwarf galaxies to test this. So in particular, um, if we're looking at things like the central density of the dwarf galaxy, a cold dark, this is obviously a cartoon, but just to kind of show you the idea, a cold dark matter model might give you a population of dwarf galaxies with this range of central densities. A particular self-interacting dark matter model that's in the core expansion phase would only form cores, so you'd shift down to this uh, lower density, so your distribution would look different. But if you instead picked a cold uh, SIDM model that was um, in this core collapse phase, you'd expect a very different distribution. Um, <clears throat> so some things might have core collapses, so they might have very high density. Um, some other things might sort of still be in the process of forming cores early on. And so actually figuring out sort of what this distribution should look like for self-interacting dark matter is something that we're trying to get a handle on. Um, with the ultimate goal of really being able to make predictions for populations of dwarf galaxies, because that's data that's already coming in and will only continue to get better. So this is uh, this is from the Saga survey. Um, there's also data from like Jenny Green's group at Princeton, but like they're essentially sampling order hundreds of these dwarf galaxies now um, outside of the Milky Way. So we are going to. Can I have attention, please? Can I have attention, please? Five safety director with an important announcement. The fire department is conducting your annual test of the fire systems in the building today. So if you hear any sirens, see any strobes, or anything else related to the fire system at this time, please disregard it's simply a test. If in fact there's any actual emergency, we will contact you via the PA system. Can I have attention, please? Can I have attention, please? <laughs> 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 interactions to be inelastic so the dark matter can lose energy as opposed to um, the case we just uh, described and this is going to be the scenario where things kind of start going really weird really crazy and um, I will show you an example where we've just completely broken the galaxy um, so we need you know there's a wide range of dark matter models that you can write down that give you you know that would result in cooling um, we needed to start with a toy scenario just to start wrapping our minds around this and, and to be able to implement this. And so for the, the toy model that we um, chose, um, it's called Atomic Dark Matter, um, which I think is gonna be clear when I describe it. Uh, in this model, you introduce a, a dark proton, you introduce a dark electron and a dark photon. So you can form um, a dark hydrogen atom, uh, but you can't form anything else because you don't have any nuclear physics in your model. So it's very, very simple. 
Um, so you can form these bound states, you form your dark hydrogen, and it can cool um, via emission of your, your dark photon. Um, the sort of the, all of the particle physics in this model gets essentially encapsulated in terms of the cooling rate of your, your gas, your, your dark gas. Um, and it does so in direct analogy to what happens in the standard model. And so that was actually the reason we started with this case, because we knew we could uh, wrap our intuition around the standard model cooling and extrapolate from it. Um, so in the standard model case, if we just talk about standard model hydrogen gas, we know what processes cause it to cool. And um, for example, the, the dominant cooling mechanism is actually collisional excitation of the hydrogen. Um, and then in the standard model, we can form helium, and that gives us some additional cooling here. So this is cooling rate as a function of temperature. And the behavior at very high temperature comes from branch drawing. So we sort of know all of these processes that contribute to cooling in the standard model gas. In our atomic dark matter model, we can tune all of our parameters to the standard model values, and we recover the same cooling curve. Um, but we don't have this peak because we never form helium. Again, because there's no nuclear physics. However, in because we're dealing with dark matter, we don't we have a lot more flexibility in terms of the parameters we can choose. So we can vary the dark proton mass, the dark electron mass, the dark coupling constant. And as we do that, what we essentially do is we shift this cooling curve in this plane, and that essentially sets how efficiently uh, our gas is able to to cool. Um, to understand what this does on a galaxy scale, uh, we had to implement this in simulation code. Um, and this had never been done before. This was work that was led by my graduate student, Sandeep Roy. Um, so he had to extend um, one of the standard simulation codes called Gizmo, which is set up to essentially simulate baryons in CDM. Um, so his extension is actually the first it's actually the first example of running one of these codes with more than one dark matter model. So it's an important step in terms of being able to integrate this dark sector physics. And then the additional model that he added in has this cooling. So it's because it's the ADM. <clears throat> so a cartoon version of how this all works in the simulation guts is as follows. We have cold dark matter particles in the simulation. Uh, we have gas. Um, those Gas particles are treated hydrodynamically, so they, they sort of, they can interact with each other. Um, and then in regions of, oh, they cool. So the cooling rates are different than in the standard model. And then as it cools, it forms regions of very high density. But um, we don't know essentially what happens. Like it doesn't form stars because there's no nuclear physics. Um, those regions of very high density would probably end up collapsing to form black holes, but we can't resolve that. I got attention, please, man. I got attention, please. Do you find so we just that label those as just dark matter plants, uh, which are kind of like the lowest resolution that we can control these things. Thank you. Um, okay, let me just show you the results and then wrap up before they do this thing again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they concluded? Oh, okay. Um, I, I was still just trying to wrap up, but I won't yell as much. 
Um, so we ran a few simulations where we just put in a small amount of this dark matter. So 94% um, of all of the dark matter was just cold. And then we just sprinkled in 6% of this dark matter that could cool like this. The reason we chose 6% was that it was allowed by cosmology. So we thought we were really not going to be doing very much to the system. We thought this would be really safe. It's allowed by cosmology. We'll sprinkle in a small fraction. We'll run these simulations. We'll show what happens, and then we'll go crazy and try to do a bunch of other stuff. What we didn't expect was that the 6% was already going to start causing a lot of problems. Um, so let me show you what it looks like. Um, so each column here is a different simulation. So this one here is just going to be a simulation that only has cold dark matter. This one here is cold dark matter plus one particular uh, variant of atomic dark matter, so one parameter space point. And this is a different atomic dark matter model, so this one cools more efficiently. Um, this top row here is just showing the cold dark matter distribution in all of them, and you can see by eye it all looks very similar. Um, you form a halo, there's some subhalos there, kind of cold dark matter looks pretty similar. Um, the atomic dark matter here and here, um, the gas collapses in, in each of these, and it collapses and it forms a disk. So very similar to the way gas in the Milky Way collapses and forms a stellar disk, uh, we see here now we're forming a dark matter disk in the center of the galaxy that's rotating. Um, and this model here cools more efficiently, so you tend to form a, a larger disk. However, most of the dark matter in this, these disks aren't stable. So they fragment and they fragment apart and they form these dark clumps and the dark clumps end up sinking down to the center of the galaxy. And so 95% of the atomic dark matter in these model, models ends up in these clumps in the center. Um, now, this is where the problem ends up arising. We put 6% of the dark matter in this atomic uh, dark matter component almost all of it ends up in the central region of the galaxy. 6% may not seem like a lot, but 6% of all of the dark matter in the Milky Way is roughly comparable to the amount of mass that's in baryons in the Milky Way. So if you collapse all of that to the center, what you have here is about the same amount of mass as the stars and the gas. And so now the two end up affecting each other directly because this is gonna be a pretty large perturbation on the stars and the gas. So if we then look at the gas disk and the stellar disk in each of these three cases, um, we have this. And you can see, especially in this last scenario where you had a lot of that atomic dark matter that collapsed to the center, um, you pretty much just end up killing the baryonic disk in the galaxy. Like you just sort of see it by eye, like you're not even forming it. It just, it sort of ends up collapsing down because it's um, feeling the pull of the additional dark matter that's there. Um, and so this baryonic disk is just contracting in response to this atomic dark matter that's, that's now present. Um, so yeah, one of the things that sort of surprises is usually when we run these things and you're like, oh, is this model ruled in or ruled out? You have to do sort of careful, oh, I need to now turn this into a mock galaxy observation to compare it to data or my uncertainties properly included, whatever. Here you can just sort of see by eye, like this model is ruled out. Like, so what's the difference if I just increased by factor of two the number of variants? Nothing would change, right? And how is this different? Like if I have like oh let me double, I use another copy of the same variants. I guess the difference is somehow you don't these guys don't form the, the well, disk, right? The dis yeah, the distribution of them is different. Uh, but and, right, so they're going to be and, and what causes this? If the physics is the same as for variants or very similar? Oh um. So it's sort of similar, it, it cools, so it's similar in that way, but the way it's very different is that there's no feedback here. So in the standard model, your gas collapses, it forms a disk, it forms stars, and then those stars explode. The stellar explosions are actually really important for maintaining a stable stellar disk in the Milky Way. That was actually the reason why 15 or 20 years ago, when people were start, starting to run these simulations, they couldn't form they couldn't actually form stable disks. They weren't putting this feedback in properly. Um, and so we don't have any feedback in this atomic dark matter model. Um, so what happens is it collapses to form a disk, very similar to in the standard model case. Then that disk doesn't remain stable because you don't have any feedback. And it just fragments into these smaller clumps 
and then those clumps are sort of sinking down to the center of the galaxy. So the big difference there in the distribution is actually coming from the fact that there's no feedback in the model. So when you say it's not stable, on what time scale? Um, it'll depend on the, the cooling time scale for the, um, for the particular like atomic dark matter model. Um, this, this happened for these particular examples, it happened very rapidly. So, I mean, by redshift, by redshift three or so, like it had mostly just collapsed into the center. Um, yeah, so it, it sort of breaks things very quickly. Um, and I, since I'm running out of time, I won't go through it, but sort of the same kind of phenomena also happens inside of dwarf galaxies. So you end up really ruining properties of dwarf galaxies and things like this. You just sort of mess up all of the galactic physics. And so kind of one of our biggest surprises and takeaways from this was that you didn't, you don't have to do very much the dark matter model. Like this is only 6% of the dark matter. We added some interesting dynamics there and we really messed things up. So like one, one thing is just sort of now, like, when we think about these broader dark sector models, recognizing that like you don't actually don't need to add that much to have like really significant impacts on galactic scales. And so these are kinds of effects that we really do need to understand because it, it may um, impact what kinds of models are viable or not. So moving forward, I mean, at now what I'm showing you is just results from two different atomic dark matter models. Sandeep is now doing a, sort of a, a much um, a, a much more extensive study where he's going to like be able to do a parameter assessment of like what actually is allowed or not, like is atomic dark matter still alive or is it not? Um, and uh, we should have a better sense of also of how to generalize these results to other dissipative models. All right. Nice. So can you still, yeah, can you still talk? So let's say I just had a, a dark hydrogen, like pro dark, pro dark proton and dark electrons, which are otherwise they don't interact with others, but Ours, but they're completely the same as ours. Yeah. Then they would also form stars, and so well, it would be in stars. I mean, so you have a model where you just have dark hydrogen. Right. Oh, that dark proton, that dark electron. The they stars form. wouldn't evolve the same way if there's yeah. no nuclear synthesis. Well, but the stars would presumably be a mixture of normal hydrogen. They, they would just. Oh. You know, it's not. It would be just a pure hydrogen star and pure dark stars. Probably all the stars would just be a mixture of the two. So even in this case, it would be such a dramatic difference. I don't think why would they be. But just... she doesn't have interactions directly between the dark sector and the hydrogen. Yeah. It would have to just well, coincidentally, it might happen. So. Such a gravitational thing. Yeah. Have you felt any sort of drag at all from, like, say, gas and these things which should separate? I guess up to the they have a gravitation early on. Now the gravitational potential will be strong enough, but early on, the, any sort of drag would separate. Them, right? mm -hmm. Not up. Yes. But even if they kind of separated those dark stars, because they still do some of them, well, it, now it becomes very model dependent. So here the assumption that somehow there is no supernova explosion. 100%. You know, yeah. In, in, so, in like, the, if you wanted to save these kinds of models, you need to add an ability to have feedback in your dark matter sector. But is it something, yeah, I'm just trying to get a sense, is it something you need to have? to add or something which actually is hard to avoid. If I just have hard, hard, dark hydrogen, then there will be dark stars. Especially if you accelerated the time scale so they seeded the ordinary star right. formation. One would expect they generically would blow up. Yeah, right? I don't know. I haven't, I haven't thought, thought very much about that. But yeah, if you, if you can have some mechanism to do that, you might be able to get around this. So I'll just, I'll just end by saying um, we're sort of just starting this process, I think, of really kind of building intuition for how we can um, alter the particle physics properties of dark matter and kind of understand what it does to galactic evolution. Um, and the long term goal is to generalize this to a variety of different models. And I'll just end with advertising for something that's sort of coming online now, um, kind of it's been growing in place for the last couple months, but it's a new project based out of CCA called the DREAMS Project. DREAMS isn't one of these like terrible acronyms <laughs> that <laughs> stands for Dark Matter and Astrophysics with Machine Learning and Simulations. Um, if you've heard of the CAMEL suite, which a lot of people at CCA have been working on, so CAMELs is um, cosmological box simulations varying over a variety of uh, uh, astrophysics parameters. That has sort of inspired us to think about whether or not we could do something similar, but for Milky Way mass. 
systems and dwarf galaxies. And so the goal of the DREAMS project is going to be to uh, deliver the largest ever suite of Milky Way zoom-in simulations where we're varying over astrophysics. We already have this for cold dark matter. So we just finished running over a thousand cold dark matter zoom-ins varying over a variety of the astrophysics um, parameters. Um, we have it for warm dark matter, which is kind of where we've been starting for the dark matter model since it's a simple one parameter thing. Um, and we have a whole plan for how we're going to sort of develop this moving forward. Um, and once you start having these samples that are this large, it allows you to both A, understand the effects of all of these uncertainties and use these as training sets for um, different kinds of machine learning or emulation problems. So um, this is just kind of getting started. Literally just a couple months, we've just started running a bunch of these sims and they're coming just off, just off the press. And we're just going to start looking at them now. But um, if anybody's interested in helping us out with this, it would be awesome. Again, super new. So looking for folks to help us out. Um, and I'll end there. Hey, one takeaway that uh, the Congress presentation is that we have to take seriously both the uh, elastic and inelastic self interaction of a dark matter as an inherent property of a dark matter. But in this case, it should also be applied to dark matter at the very beginning of the universe, starting within the first second after the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder if uh, this is going to lead to clumping of uh, dark matter in the early universe. It may explain some of the very early giant galaxies that have been recently, recently observed. Yeah, so that actually has been something that we've been kind of kicking around related to this, um, these kind of dissipative dark matter models, because we do find that if this sort of collapse, these very dense dark matter halos happen super early, very, very early. Um, and uh, one of the things that we uh, actually, we did start kind of setting this up. We haven't worked it all out, but that was actually exactly one of the things we wanted to kind of explore. Once we have a better sense for which of these models is actually allowed by present day data, then understanding the implications for early universe data um, will be super important. Because you, whatever model, right, you need to have it obviously be consistent across all redshift, right? And so here we're really mainly looking, focusing on like low redshift observables, but the high redshift observable also has to be consistent. I think JWST is going to be super interesting and very relevant there. Both the elastic and inelastic models also change formation, <coughs> stellar formation histories. Um, I, we have these plots, I didn't have time to show them, but that's another really interesting observable in JWC and other probes as well. But looking at just the stellar formation history as a function of time can be an interesting indicator for the dark matter physics as well. Hi, Miranda. I have yeah. one question. So, could you go to the, uh, the constraint plot of the self interacting dark matter, which was given by Orin? Yeah, I just, uh, uh, yeah, I'm still confused about the uh, region where the self, uh, self interaction cross section is large. So, you mean when the cross section, yes, yeah, this white region. Yeah. So, do you mean in this region, then the thermalization theory among the inside the galaxy is very strong that you don't have the core collapse? No, you do have core collapse. You do have. Yeah, so pretty white. much every part of this white region, you have some degree. You expect to have some degree of core collapse. Yeah. Um, like you know, obviously, the the larger the cross section you go to, the yeah. more effective the core collapsing process is going to be, yeah. and it will be less effective down here. But you will have some degree of core collapse anywhere in that white region. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just uh, confused because you say you still have the core collapse, and uh, then why is this region not excluded? Because you you are constraining about the I think you 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 said in your black region uh, sorry blue region is the mass around the galaxy for example. The, so the, this blue region. Yes. Yes. This blue region is actually coming from Draco. So okay. Draco is yeah. a dwarf galaxy that's very cuspy. Yeah. Um. So the fact that it's cuspy excludes self-interacting models that would give, predict oh. that it should have a big core. So that's oh, where so this huge strain is coming from. Um, and the reason that not all of this region is excluded yet is um, uh, because we don't, well, because we don't know yet, it, it actually may be partially excluded. We just don't really know yet what all of the observables should be in this gravidomal collapse regime. Um, so that's kind of what we need to figure out, like exactly what, 
how, you know, are we modeling this correctly, both with the numerics, but also semi-analytically to be able to make very distinctive predictions for what we'd expect for the, like, dwarf distributions or anything like that in this regime. And then we can sort of go in and test that. Yeah. So it, it may, part of it may actually be excluded. We just don't know yet because the theory hasn't kind of caught up to being able to make the predictions for, for observations. Go back to the plot where you were showing the two different ADN models. Um, the simulation the results? The on and edge on. <laughs> this one? Um, yeah, this. so here the second ADN model has like a bigger diffuse disk. Mm -hmm. um, then in the next plot, um, I was wondering if this is maybe just a color scale effect of the um, the cloud of baryons is smaller in the second one, which had like a bigger disk in the previous slide. But but on the edge on one, I think it's more consistent with the previous slide, at least visually. Oh yeah, it is a little bit of a color scale effect. So um, you can, I mean, this so it does extend out further, but the actual density of the EDM on the outskirts is still pretty small. So like most of it is still here, like in the center even though the, the disk seems like pretty extended. And so um, so it, it does end up, that, that's the reason why it still ends up causing the baryons to contract it. And that's true compared to like relatively as well, like between the two models, because in the previous slide, um, the first model, the first ADN model doesn't spread out as much, but it still has like a larger baryon disk in the second. Uh, uh, yeah, because this one here just ends up the, the this model here ends up with comparatively like a little bit. Um, yeah, it, it's comparatively just the, the enclosed mass. I don't have these plots, but like the enclosed mass is actually still it's a little lower as a function of radius for this model than it is for for this one, and that's the reason it has a different effect on the gas. Yeah, it is a, it is a little hard to tell just from the color scale plots. Yeah, so I have uh, one question about uh, your curve, about the slope, and the, your, your diagram about the mass of the galaxy and the slope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's very, very yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit confused about, you say, for example, from when you mass vary from the mass range of the Osher faint dwarfs to the Milky Way galaxy. So when you increase mass, then you then, then you, then you say, for example, for the, for the when you are near the Milky Way mass, then your star is still so the feedback parametric feedback is still is more, but then your your because your galaxy become larger than because I'm 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 feeling it's a bit hard for me to quantify this feedback because if my I naively speak okay so the attractive force the potential well of the galaxy is proportional to the mass mm -hmm. of mass of the galaxy and if the star number is also if I naively assume the star number is also proportional mass of the galaxy, that, then if I divide it by these two quantities, then they just cancel out. Then it seems that it's indifferent. But I, I think it's just a very naive, you know, naive uh, estimation. So I'm just wondering how, how, how to, uh, to, yeah, how to, how to. Yeah, I'm not trying to totally follow the, um, yeah. the estimation. Like the way you would, um, uh, it's the way you would calculate this. This is actually just using like a genes. You can actually do this for the SIDM case. You do like a full genes analysis, and you put in like when you don't put in the baryonic potential, like you get a poor thing, and then you put in the baryonic potential, and you see it goes back to being cuspy. So it is kind of all baked into that sort of this sort of very standard genes analysis, um, and and then the results that are obtained with simulation essentially reproduce that. So like, yeah, I don't know if I'm if I'm addressing your question other than to say this. You're right. There's a competition of these two yes. effects, and we kind of need to know like which one wins out. And it is. A, I agree with you. It is a little bit unclear to just kind of know off the bat. But if you actually do the full genes analysis, you do end up getting the yes. same result using the same. Yeah, genes. yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah, I think my kind of estimation is very nice because, because yeah, just what I feel is you know if I use this estimation, then actually they should have the same slope. You know, so it's just flat slope. Yeah. So they should have the same yeah. GP, you know. But yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I, I think that what, is, what happens is that if you have an explosion, then the observers are like, you know,
there's certain technical stuff, right? Yes, and you'll be able to overcome it.